thank you first for all the missionaries. And I want to pray for all the missionaries that you look over them, especially that missionary in Africa. I know they're going through some Africa things there. All oh, the armed services, Lord, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines, and the Coast Guard, Lord. I don't know what they do, but they guard stuff in our, in our coast. And people I, in our very own church right here. All the people under the steeple, Lord. And this will probably be my last time for this one request, but Martha Hanover, Lord, or she is not emotionally equipped and she lacks the social skills, Lord. Please, maybe you don't want to help her. I don't know, but, and then Lord, all the people. God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our plate of barbecue ribs. Father God, I pray that you, Father God, be honored, Father God. And Father God, I just thank you for being Father God, because you are our Father God. I love you, Father God. We love you, Father God. You want me to, you want me to pray? Like right now? Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. Thank you. Dear precious Father Heaven, Lord, thank you for everything. Lord, please uh, remember the Titans, just plethora of uh, bountiful, uh, beautiful things daily, every day. Bless, bless these tithes and offerings for all of us to share. They may be submitted to all four corners of, of your nations to Constantinople or Istanbul or where, wherever bless these tithes and offerings I said that uh, in your heavenly father's name amen So the disciples saw John's disciples praying. But they were praying in such a different way. Meaningful and deep. Authentic. And so one of Jesus' disciples said, man, I want that. I want what they are having in prayer. But you see, all Jewish kids learn how to pray from an early age. But this was different. And they wanted it. So they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, teach us to pray like John's disciples pray. We want that. We want that. This morning we're going to continue our series on the Lord's Prayer. And it is my hope and my prayer that when we're finished with our time together, we will want something more. We will want that. Let us pray. Just fill us with your spirit, God. We want to hear you. We want to see you. We want to be changed because of you. Amen. And so Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father. And I can almost imagine that the disciples were thinking, uh, okay, Father, what else? But that's, that's how Jesus started in this prayer in Luke 11. He started with Father. And it was so explosive, that one particular word. No adornment, no superfluous language, no long intro, just Father. Because just that word 
that very simple word, immediately the disciples knew that this prayer was going to be different. Why? Because immediately it pointed to something personal. It pointed straight away to a relationship, straight into the heart of God the Father. A heart full of love, a heart full of passion for us, a heart full of compassion and mercy. And so when Jesus was asked, teach us to pray, it's interesting to note that um, he did not teach them how to pray. He did not teach them how to pray. Rather, he taught them who to pray to. And you know, that is something that is so important here, to understand who we are praying to. And this is why Jesus began with Father, because he needed to set the tone. He needed to set this foundation from the very beginning that this term Father goes straight into the heart of God himself. And I have come to understand in my own life that our prayer experience will always lack if we put more emphasis on the how-to than the who-to. And I'm sorry for you English majors out there. I know that this is bad English, all right? But you know what I'm talking about. It's the who that we need to focus on. And you know, there's, a, there's an author by the name of Kent uh, Hughes, and, and he describes this, this, this feeling and this understanding of what, what the Father is. And listen to what he says here. Calling God Father brings sweetness to our souls, points to connectedness and intimacy, a sense of affection and security, an upward rush of a sense of paternity. He is my Father. I am his kid. We are his kids. And we are going to have this conversation with him. And this conversation is called prayer. That's different. And that's what Jesus was showing them. And that is what Jesus is showing us today. This, this intimate relationship, this, this, this sweetness of this relationship you know, with the one that we are praying to, to be honest with you, is the engine. It is the foundation. It is the framework for us to understand and experience the rest of the Lord's Prayer. I want to keep you to keep that in mind. Knowing who God is informs and forms our understanding of the rest of the Lord's Prayer. And I believe that when we know who we are praying to, whom we are talking to, the rest of the Lord's Prayer will not only make sense to us, but it will become a reality in our everyday lives. And as we are going through this journey together as a church, I just don't want to be able to recite the Lord's Prayer. I've been able to recite the Lord's Prayer probably ever since I was seven or eight years old. I had to recite the Lord's Prayer before I was baptized. That was a requirement. But as I have grown older, I have realized that for too long, that's exactly what I had been doing, reciting the Lord's Prayer. But now I want to live it. I mean, I really want to live it. And I want to experience it because I want to experience all the different aspects of God that are embedded in this prayer. And I want to experience God daily in the activities of my daily living. So beginning right now, beginning today, I want to challenge you. Live it. Experience it. Know it. But most importantly, Know the God to whom you are praying to. So let's do this together. Again, we're looking at the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11. Most of us 
as we were younger, we memorized the Matthew version of the Lord's Prayer. But we're going to take this month and just kind of rethink it just a little bit. Because there's some powerful aspects of this prayer that I think Luke just hones right in. That perhaps the prayer in Matthew just um, lengthens it a little bit. So let's take a look here. Let's together, let's recite this prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. So last week, Pastor Mike started off the series looking at hallowed be your name. And what we learned and what we understood that, that, that what this means here, when we say hallowed be your name, we are really saying and declaring the greatness and the goodness and the majesty and the power and the amazingness of who God is. It is who God is. Is. And notice it begins at the top of this prayer. So today we're going to look at your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. What does this really mean? Well, first of all, God's kingdom refers to God's reign, to God's rule. God's kingdom really signifies that this is where God is in charge. This is God's way of doing things in this kingdom. He is sovereign. He is majesty. This is his territory. And when we are in God's territory, we do what God wants us to do. You know, in June, um, all the pastors took a trip to Texas to attend the North American Division of Pastors Conference. And um, uh, while, while we were there, we rented a car. And it, as I was in the counter and get, you know, finishing up all the paperwork, um, the counter person said, okay, you guys are from the East Coast. Let me tell you how things are done here in Texas. I said, okay, great. So she starts telling me about cell phones. I said, oh, cell phones. Okay, in Maryland, cell phones are hands-free. You will get a ticket, or you might even get arrested if you are driving. All right. If you are driving and you're holding the cell phone. And she says to me, oh, you don't have to worry about that here in Texas. We don't have that kind of law. However, if you do go to certain cities in Texas, it is hands-free. So you might get a ticket. And I said, okay, what are those cities? I don't know. <laughs> Got it. And I said, and I assume that uh, texting is uh, not allowed too. She goes, oh, there are no laws against texting here in Texas. But you know, it's a good idea not to text and drive at the same time. Great. I said, what else can you tell us? about um, driving here in Texas. And she says to me, she says, well, you know, here's something really interesting. Um, you don't have to go to the speed limit. <laughs> I said, what? Will you please repeat that for me? She said, you don't have to go the speed limit. There are some areas in Texas in which you can just fly. And I said, well, what does fly mean? And she goes, 15 miles, 18 miles over the speed limit. It'll still be okay kind of like driving here in Texas. And then lastly, she said one last important thing. Cattle always gets the right of way. And I realized, you know what? I'm in Texas. And when you are in Texas, you are Texas. I'm not in Maryland. I am in Texas. And I do what they do in Texas. So, your kingdom come. God is in charge. This is his territory. He is sovereign in this kingdom. What he says goes. He is in charge. You know, there's a lot to be said about the kingdom of God. Who it is, 
and when it will be. But let's simplify it just a little bit here. Because honestly, your kingdom come really boils down to two words. Let me say that again. Your kingdom come boils down to two words. Our surrender. I don't like the word surrender. Why? Because in my mind, it, it conjures up feelings of, of defeat. It conjures up, up negative feelings. And it's really interesting. I, I really spent some time understanding what, what, what is it about surrender that is so difficult for me. And so I looked up the definition, and here are some very interesting definitions of the word surrender. Take a look at it. To stop fighting and accept defeat. To give up something that is yours to someone else, usually because you have been forced to do so. Do you see how that conjures up some negative emotions and negative feelings? Here's another definition. To abandon oneself entirely to a powerful emotion or influence. To give in to. And no wonder, no wonder surrender is something that is so difficult for us to do. Because it is couched in the language of defeat and failure. And who wants to live a life of defeat and failure? And what's also interesting here, the call... The call to stand firm and not surrender can be a pretty powerful rallying call. You know, one of my favorite individuals in all of history is Winston Churchill. And in June 1940, Winston Churchill stood before the British Parliament. You see, it had just happened after the Allied troops were handed a devastating defeat by the Nazi. And so the Allied troops were pushed, pushed all the way back to Dunkirk. And Dunkirk is in the north of France, right across the channel from England. And literally, by the grace of God, hundreds and thousands of Allied troops were evacuated off mainland Europe. But here's what's so significant about that. At that very point, when the last Allied soldier left France, left Dunkirk, there were no more Allied troops in Europe. And Europe was at the mercy of the Nazi. But the war was not over because the Nazis had their eye on England. And so Winston Churchill stood before the parliament and he needed to speak words that will encourage his nation. And so this is what he said. We shall go on to the end we shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the, in the hills. We shall never surrender. And it was that speech that mobilized this little tiny island to stand up against the Nazi onslaught. We shall never surrender. Do you see? No wonder surrender is so difficult for us. Because I'm feeling that surrender is, surrendering is viscerally in opposition to who we are as human beings. We, we, we are taught and we are learned and it is innate in us to survive, to live, to exist. Therefore, we cannot surrender. Take a look at the words of surrender. Defeat is a word that stands up very strong in our minds. And with the meaning of this, of, of this word, how then can we fully understand and experience your kingdom come. 
How can we do that? Because your kingdom come, God in charge, in essence implies that we are defeated and we are experienced failure as a human being. But let me tell you something. These words that you see here, these words, this is not God's language for surrender. God has a totally different understanding. God has a totally different uh, definition for surrender. Defeat and failure are not part of God's kingdom speech. I want to make that very clear to you. Not part of God's kingdom speech. Therefore, how do we reconcile our flesh understanding of surrender with your kingdom come. I often ask God, God, what does your kingdom come look in my life? Because I'll be honest with you, I struggle with this. You know, that, that need for control. I struggle with this. And many times I find myself only giving God maybe 60%. And the irony here and the laughable thing is I celebrate, yay, I, got, I gave God 60%. When it goes up to 75%, I even celebrate more and even have a bowl of ice cream. Yay, 75% I gave to God. But that's not the definition of your kingdom come. Your kingdom come means complete surrender on your part. So what does this look like? What is God's rule and God's reign? Let me show you what it looks like. Your kingdom come. Here's what it looks like. Your kingdom come. This is what it looks like. Your kingdom come. This is what it looks like. Your kingdom come. This is what it looks like. Surrender sure does look different, doesn't it, from a kingdom perspective. You see, it really is about a change in perspective for us. And this change in perspective comes from every single word in this book. And what God does when he says, your kingdom come, when we ask for that, God is saying, great, thank you for inviting me in, because now I am going to give you a completely different perspective. I am going to define for you a different way of understanding what surrender is. It is not defeat. It is not failure. It is about me when you surrender to me in my kingdom. There was such a relief in my heart and in my mind when that was revealed to me. Because it's not anything that I have to do. 
when I pray those words, your kingdom come. But it's everything who I need to know. And that is my God, my Father. But there's another kingdom perspective. And this perspective is often overlooked. Because you know what? We are just so focused and so zoned into our own difficulties of what it means to surrender. And this particular perspective is a, is, is a true and complete perspective of surrender. And because of this perspective, your kingdom come is a reality in our lives today. Though he was God, we're talking about Jesus here. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up. Say this with me. He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in disobedience to God, in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. This, folks, this, folks, is a completely different perspective of surrender that can be not only an encouragement for us, but a model for us. And let me tell you, Jesus had a lot more to give up than we do. Because of this surrender, folks, because of this surrender, the kingdom has come. The kingdom is here. And the kingdom will come again when Jesus comes the second time. And you know, our surrender, our surrender enables all the privileges of God's kingdom to be a reality for us today. But here's something that I have discovered. The privileges of God's kingdom, a lot of times we think of it in terms of possessions and wealth and things that God gives to us. And yes, yes, those are some privileges of God's kingdom. But I don't think that that's the focus that God has when he implores us to say, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come gives us some privileges. And the privilege of God's kingdom is his presence. It's his presence. And when we think of it in that perspective, it's not only powerful, but it's meaningful to us, doesn't it? Isn't it? God's presence. You know, I, I, I recall to the text in Exodus when Moses is having this discussion with God. And Moses says to God, God, I want to see you. God, we're getting ready to go into this, this new place and this new land. And, 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 and I, I am scared. I don't know how we are going to do this, but I need to see you, God. And God says, I will give you my presence. And let me tell you, that's all that Moses needed. That was all that Moses needed because next, after that, that interchange with God, Moses did something so bold. Moses did something so brash. It is actually almost equal to when Jesus said in the prayer, this is how you are to pray, Father. Moses said to God, I want to see your face. And when we say, Father, that is 
is really what we are saying. God, I want to see your face. Show me your face. And then as Moses, as Moses made this request, the Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will call out my name to you. I will show kindness to anyone I choose. And I will show mercy to anyone I choose. I am God. And I give you my presence. You know, it's, it's this presence of God. It's, it's this closeness with him. It's knowing him so well and so thoroughly that you will never fear. You will never lack. And you will never have any want. Because, you know, we're reminded in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Jesus knew how important this was. Jesus knows how important it is for us to know the God to whom we pray to. And in this intimate, active, affectionate relationship with God, in his kingdom, we will be able to understand the full meaning of the rest of the prayer. But not just to understand it, but to live it daily in the full realization of what we are truly praying for. We will live the privileges of his kingdom in our lives, which is his presence. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. This shapes and informs what we are going to be unpacking these next few weeks. Because you see, the, 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 the next part of the Lord's Prayer deals specifically with us and our lives and the things that we face on a daily basis. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Amen. Your kingdom come. It's my prayer for you this week. That as you fall on your knees. And you say to God our Father. Your kingdom come. He will make that a reality in your life. So that you are not just going to recite it, but you will believe it, you will know it, you will live it. At this time, I want to encourage you to take out your uh, Connect card because we do have some next steps. Some next steps. As, as a way of keeping this kind of in the forefront of your minds this week. You know, maybe this week, maybe today, you need to be more aware of what you are praying, what the words mean when you say them. Maybe this week, you know, you're seeking to strengthen your relationship with God through prayer. Or maybe, maybe this, this week, maybe today, you can begin this journey in not only understanding what surrendering is, but living it on a daily basis. And so after you fill this out, if you have any other prayer requests, please feel free to, uh, to write it in the back and, um, and just drop it in the um, offering plate when it comes. And I just also want to let you know that every prayer request is prayed for every single week. So please know that as you write this, it is not just going into an empty box. There are people that are on their knees for you.